boys. And you know what time it is. What time is it, Avon? It's time to everybody together save, save that, that pig. pig. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. It's everybody's favorite game show to tune into every Sunday about this time or maybe any other time when we decide that it's time to say that, that pig. pig yes that's right we are going to show and throw up three different pigs on the board right now <laughs> everyone uh in the chat just type one two three depending on which pig it is that you see that you want to highlight ready and three two, two one, one go looks like nobody in the chat has selected pig. anything so all of those pigs will die sorry folks no lucky winners this week on <laughs> save that pig it's all right I, I actually ate them all because i had so much pork for dinner <laughs> oh my god <laughs> it's pretty disgusting how much pork i ate for dinner Oh boy. We'll get uh, into that soon. My name's Yvonne, over there. Julian, welcome. And welcome to the Hungover Podcast. The podcast. This is a weekly topical podcast, uh, which covers a variety of topics. Today we're getting into the nitty gritty, some of the overall interesting things that are happening with Google, the European Union, and how the European Union is handling these large tech companies slightly differently than, or incredibly differently, than the Trump administration is here at home. But if you want to catch this or any other of our podcasts, you can do that in several different ways, Julian. I think YouTube, yeah. I think Twitch, and then I think iTunes, and Google Play, uh -huh. and SoundCloud. And Man, you know what you can do if sick. you love this show so or have something to say or anything? You can go on to that iTunes, take two to five minutes out of your day, yeah. write up a little comment, tell us what you thought of our podcast so that we can help increase our visibility and make sure that we do get those numbers to save that pig. We and really Julian, need to. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. think that was the best I've ever done the spiel. That was really impressive, Yvonne. <laughs> I think you're on a roll today. You're really focused, and, and I like that you're bringing 110% to this podcast. It's going to be a good one, guys. It's the only it's thing be I bring 110% to on this channel. It's all that the matters, podcast. though. It, the podcast <laughs> is it's where we get the shit done, you know? We get everything off our chest for the week, and then we can go in, clean slate, and have a good time. So, Vaughn, you know how we start our podcast out every single week by asking each other what media have you been consuming this week uh the past week and you know uh what'd you drink last night so this week uh has been a very light media week for me i'll tell you why i was working over in buffalo and then on friday i left the world of technology and went deepington into the woods i was nice. in the adirondacks all weekend holy crap unplugging uh, how did it feel it was amazing it was great i was uh we didn't get a campsite because uh -huh. we didn't have a tent large enough to accommodate all of us so we got oh. a motel and a motel experience <laughs> is one of the quintessential american experiences overpaying for a shitty room uh <laughs> it was actually a decent room it was just yeah. the beds were a little bit wonky and so i oh, ended well. up hurting my hip on the second night but it was a fun experience nonetheless. They had a waffle maker for continental breakfast and a now heated pool, so now... we were all good. Whoa, heated pool? Yeah, man. <laughs> that is, uh, I, well, one, I don't know if I would go into a motel heated pool. It, the but... heater was off. <laughs> also. It, it existed, but it wasn't working. <laughs> that's pretty awesome that they would have a heated pool at a motel. Uh, I'm impressed. That motel is balling out. That's pretty yeah, sweet. It was an Econo Lodge, but here's the best thing. Econo so Lodge, nice. Friday, we got in. We I've went to this place called the Naked Turtle. Uh, had a bucket of coronitas and a mojito and coronitas. two additional coronitas for that's, free, that's might I the, add, uh, because of my level of negotiation. The tiny it, bottle the that you can seven, literally chug. In. Yeah, seven fluid ounces. So you can literally just... <laughs> those are the best. Just tip it I back they and make let those. it go. <laughs> So, uh, we, we got there and, uh, it was four of us, glass. two people in our party ordered, uh, a couple cornitas. And yeah. then later we saw that you could get a bucket of them and it was obviously cheaper to get the bucket than the individual. Yeah, so well, I, I asked the effort. waitress, would it be possible to get the three more cornitas for the bucket and count these two that we already have mm -hmm. as part of the bucket? And she was like, yeah, 
we can do that. <laughs> yeah, we got you. Don't and worry. And I was like, this is the dopest. This is They a came great back, place. five Cornitas in the bunk house. Fuck. She's like, they didn't <laughs> understand, so those two, on me. Yes. Nice. Victory all the way. You got uh, The food was incredibly burn. bad. I don't know how you fuck up a Caesar salad, but they managed to. Um, oh boy. My salmon Caesar salad was just salmon and then like romaine hearts chopped up. Oh. No Caesar dressing. Oh. Literally. No Caesar dressing? And no croutons. Oh my god. And then I was like, oh my god. Can, wasn't this supposed to have croutons and can I get Caesar on the side? And she's like, I think we might be out. And then she came back and the waitress was like, exactly. You want ranch? <laughs> They didn't have. They had Caesar and they had croutons. They just oh didn't do God. anything they just didn't for care. my salad. It was well, the worst. Guess how much that salad cost? Twenty Salmon bucks. Caesar salad. It was twenty bucks. Yeah, that is. Uh, that's the restaurant business for uh, you. It's anyway. ride or die out there, man. <laughs> I can't even give you good salad. <laughs> so Saturday, it's the rough, media man. I consumed was the media of nature. I went on a uh, fifteen-mile hike mm-hmm. up. To the peak of New York, I went to the tallest point in New York on Mount That's Marcy. Awesome. This is my f- second time going there, but my first time in like eleven or twelve years. Nice. And I went Very with nice. my group of friends. Every, <laughs> all of the friends were reached points of sheer exhaustion <laughs> throughout. <laughs> I was like, let's keep going. <laughs> uh, awesome. Anyway, it was it was great fun. I had a good time. Uh, got to the top, got back down, and like I think it took us 12 and a half, 13 hours. That's a good hike, um, man. Yeah, I think we could have done it much faster, like 10 hours probably, if we were going my pace. <laughs> but I would have been exhausted time. by the end. Instead, when we got to the bottom of it, I was able to run from our point down and up a hill to our car which was about a mile away nice very nice so yeah i still had the strength i still had the strength you and got, to reward myself going on. you know what i went to a mega breakfast no a brewery, a brewery and then a mega breakfast <laughs> okay <laughs> so for dinner that night we went to a brewery <laughs> and i tried out the meatless impossible burger now how oh we talked about that last week go ahead I know. and listen to the podcast where we talk about cultured meat if this is your first hungover podcast last week we did talk about the impossible burger for a little bit uh how was it guess what it actually is amazing that is impressive i mean a beef burger is is better damn straight it is damn Uh, straight it is there's just (laughs) something there's something a little wrong about it like uh, it's not as juicy. Mm-hmm. It is good. It's like dense, and they you can get them with a, like some beet juice, so it gives that redness to it. Yeah. But it's not as juicy. There's something a little bit texture wise that's different. But the taste is pretty much similar. I would qualify it as like high end um, fast food stuff. Ah, like it's better than McDonald's. Pack. So it's like a, a Shake Shack, perhaps. Mm-hmm. That's not bad, man. Shake Shack is an excellent Shake Shack or like or um, a Five Guys. Five or something Guys? Like that. I love Five Guys. I, I will tell you. You know, you order uh, uh, fries there, they just throw it in a bag, a paper bag. That's it. And they hand you some fries. Sometimes not even salted. And they're like, fuck you, man. You ordered fries and we all hate ourselves, so <laughs> here's your fries. I get the here. fries with like the the special <laughs> seasoning that they have. Or whatever. Yeah, they they have that too. I I've made the mistake of not doing that though. <laughs> and they just didn't. They just throw like a wad of fries in a bag <laughs> and just throw it at me. That's it. We <laughs> didn't we didn't do anything to this. We actually squished them together yeah, after they came out of the fryer and just threw them into the bag. <laughs> it's how we get it to fit in the bag. It's just <laughs> how it works. <laughs> Gross. And so the Meatless Impossible Burger was great, but the other thing that was super interesting, this is a Big Slide Brewery in mm-hmm. Lake Placid. Uh, they Sounds did a Poblano beer. I'm into Poblanos any time of the any time of the year, any time of the day, and they made that in the beer, huh? Yeah, so That's it's like good. a hot pepper beer. Was it a darker it beer? It's a pale ale. Oh, pale ale. Nice. Yeah, Very pale nice. ale. I think it was like uh, 5.2 or 4.8. So like okay. your standard like mid-tier beer ABV. Um, but it was incredible that you could really taste the poblano. Nice. So you took a, a, like a, a deeper sip. 
Yeah. And the finish note, the thing that stays in your mouth, is poblano taste. That's pretty impressive. And it had a little bit of spice to it, too. That's cool. I once had a... I, I went on a beer tour of uh, Long Island City in, in New York City. Uh, why that sentence doesn't make sense, but it does if you <laughs> live in New York City. Um, <laughs> you talked about it on this here podcast. Yeah, uh, there, there's a bunch of um, breweries in, in Long Island City, which is in Queens. Um, and one of them did a jalapeno burger, but it was burger, uh, jalapeno beer, but it was a stout. Um, or, yeah, mm-hmm. it, was, it was like a... I would say more like a Negro Modelo, actually, in terms, but a little, a little more creamy in terms. So like okay. halfway between stout and Negro Modelo, but it, it tasted like a jalapeno. Can't say by that point I was really full on beer, so I couldn't finish it. <laughs> but <laughs> I'll tell you, it tasted like a jalapeno. I don't know. It was nice. pretty good. It's pretty good. That sounds pretty good, though. Uh, the- yeah. I think the poblano was nice because it wasn't too spicy. It just mm-hmm. had that nice flavor. They also, I this place just has a lot of nice beers. They had a really good double IPA. I bought a crowler of it, so Ooh, I got cool. a big one. Poblano uh, might be my favorite pepper. I like so poblanos. it's it's unique, and it can be spicy. And spicy. It can, it can be mild, but you can stuff it, and that's yeah, what's most important. Yeah, it's my favorite thing to do with them. They're you so just take good. a shit ton of rice, a shit ton, <laughs> well, a you small amount beans. of rice, a shit ton of of cheese and a little bit of beans <laughs> might as well just put a, a block of cheese in there i uh, don't think Gross. that i have it julian <laughs> don't think that i have it didn't even melt it just made a sandwich and eat oh god uh look poblanos are great avon but i'll tell you you know what's better no actually yeah you know what's better than poblanos no. octopath traveler this game is so <laughs> fucking good I love. I was this hoping game so that much. would be good. <laughs> it is so good. I am so addicted to this game. In the first week that it's been out, it came out on Friday of last week. I've put in thirty-six hours in this game, and that wow, that's I impressive. Mean, when you're in high school, when you're in college, pff, you can laugh at that. You do that in a weekend, no problem. But when you're a busy guy like me, you don't have that much time to game. But you still find time when a great game like this comes out. I am loving this game. It's totally tickling that fancy of a JRPG, and I really love it. Um, so I highly suggest anyone who uh, does not have, uh, has not played the game and has a Switch, I highly suggest you pick it up. I believe there were some Switch deals um this week I'm, I'm not sure there was like a switch bundle that came with a bunch of games for the same price as a switch so you get the games for free but I, I don't know if it's still going and i also didn't look too deeply into it but i'm excited for this you, game you have the switch so yeah. i know yeah that's why I, look i'm always on the lookout for deals for everyone that i know so just in case they are looking to buy something but anyways um this game's great pick it up i won't belabor the point it's uh i think it's well i do want to say though the the most important thing that this game does even for the gaming industry is is so it's selling like gangbusters right now i I think square enix did not anticipate that this game would sell so well so people are actually having trouble buying physical copies of the game right now so that Mm -hmm. sucks for anyone who likes physical copies of games i bought it digitally whatever but the coolest thing is that this game they've announced that there's no dlc coming out they said this is a complete game this is what you're getting and there was no as far as i knew there was no huge day one patch there was no day one patch no dlc single player rpg niche game selling gangbusters so this is really important for the gaming industry we don't need to go down this path that ubisoft and and activision and ea are trying to push us towards with games as a service and uh continuously pumping money into the game releasing a game that isn't even close to done and releasing a a patch that's like twice the size of the game as soon as day one (coughs) so Yeah, so I'm just saying this game is really great and it should be praised not only because it's a great game, but also because of all the things it does in terms of uh, how we used to play games. You know, we, we when we when games were released back in the day before the internet, that was the game you got. So this game uh, is polished 
to a T and a really great game. But so the gameplay is good. The looks are mm-hmm. good. I think it is one of the most intriguing, visually stunning. Also thing. that too. And you're saying the narrative is living up to the gameplay and the yeah. Visual. I am really loving all the stories as well, uh, because they're just it's it's so there's eight different stories. There's eight different characters. I wanted the stories to, and a lot of people are complaining about this. I wanted the stories to cross over a little more. They don't really cross over at all. But I think that's really cool in a way because you sort of <laughs> what are you doing? You sort of just get a I'm showing a, the eight paths and how they crisscross. Yes, yeah, that's good. <laughs> they don't really cross over too much, but um, or at Yet. all. No, I, I don't think they do at all. But the cool thing is that you're you don't really the way I'm play, playing it anyways, and I really think the way the developers intended you to play is that you sort of do one chapter at a time of each person's story so you get a a taste of everyone's story and nothing gets sort of bogged down and you're just not just following the same story the whole time so it mixes things up and that's a really cool uh game trope or game mechanic there so i I think that's a pretty good way to tell the story a good way to break up pacing and things i think Mm -hmm. yeah that's nice I, I think that often you get more. bogged down into the same repeated paths, so being able to break it up in a unique way, I think it's also a way to kind of revitalize that that sense of gaming that was kind of lost that like uh, the Battle Royale games give you, right? Oh, yeah. The Battle, Battle Royale, Royale games, it's like you're in it for like 20 minutes, you're out, and it's a fresh new... Yeah. It's the same cycle, but it feels a little bit fresher because... It's a completely new set of people you're playing with, etc. Um, it's just the, the mechanics you feel are the same. So Very this cool, is kind yeah. of a way to revitalize the RPG genre, which falls often into that cycle of grind, oh, yeah. grind, grinding, 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 grinding. Uh, there's yeah, the cool thing is it, there's not really much grinding to do, or you don't have to grind too much, or at least I haven't had to yet. Um, because each story chapter gives you a recommended level and you can just go off and do someone else's story that's a lower recommended level and use that as a way to progress the story and also level up so it's not a monotonous grind uh to level up it's something you you feel like you're accomplishing things and becoming more powerful uh as you go so i I think it's really good pacing it's good game great good game anyways avon yo I've got no segue yet again, but we did this. Divine Hailstorm says I should be buzzed to watch these lol. <laughs> yes. Well, hey, I'm glad you made it to the podcast, my friend. Avon. You're welcome to enjoy what anything is, while we go through. What you is know, the topic? is Octopath Traveler best in Dolby Digital 5.1 surround sound? I, you know, I, I feel like it might have that. Uh, 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 you know what else uh, is 5.1 and has a huge resounding impact across the world the 5.1 billion dollars that the eu has fined google boom did you see that feel the professionalness in that segue this guy Uh, is out of control (laughs) so the eu uh pretty recently a few days ago uh, find Google $5.1 billion in their Android antitrust case. Uh, this is a huge amount of money uh, revolving around the uh, application of Google's search engines and the unfair use of how Google applied their search engine to benefit themselves. It's kind of a very interesting showcase in how a company that produces a tool uh, then uses that tool to better its own other branches but because the tool has become somewhat ubiquitous and considered somewhat Mm -hmm. of a utility it has limits to what they can do in order to impact their own self so what do you think this says about the european union's um attitude towards uh, silicon valley big tech companies I, I like what they're doing. You know, they're, they're putting their foot down here and they, they can see that, that this type of activity coming from Google um, can really set a precedent for the rest of the industry. 
uh, just allowing them to totally get a, a monopoly on the market of Android phones, um, just based on having access to everyone's data on every Android phone, be just um, because they p were allowed to push their uh, product to the masses in front of everyone else's product, uh, as opposed to just having an equal marketplace. Uh, in place for the Android marketplace. I think this is a really good uh, move on the EU in terms of um, privacy rights, at least in the European U Union. And Divine Hailstorm says the EU could definitely use that money as well. <laughs> yeah, 5.1 sure. billion, not a small amount. Of course, this doesn't mean that the 5.1 is going to be transferred over in the next month. Most yeah, likely this not will even go on the next year. It'll take a few years, but this is a tremendous size of fine. And what mm -hmm. will happen is that Google has already set its appeal against this, and the court proceedings will take a long time, but the $5.1 billion will have to be put into a uh, holding trust, basically, so that it will continue to be withheld from Google's ability to use it, etc. Of course, the European Union also won't be able to use it, but it's there for with the eventuality of Google winning the case or winning the appeal or the European Union having the decision remain as Google loses the appeal. It's a lot of money. And yeah. regardless of the, the appeal process, if Google doesn't comply with, the, uh, with the, what the European Union wants in terms of leveling the playing field, with the uh, search engine and apps that they're pushing onto their uh, smartphones, mm -hmm. the Android smartphones, yeah. then they can be fined uh, up to 5% of the worldwide average daily revenue of its parent company, Alphabet. That wow. is a tremendous amount of money. Think that about is... how much money Google earns in a day, and 5% of that could be yeah, <laughs> At least. multi. Yeah. There, yeah, I mean, everyone uses Google, and there are so many ads... Uh, to have be had on Google, uh, just in general, <laughs> you know, it's pretty crazy. Uh, so I, I really I I like that the EU is doing this, and it really seems that they're taking the exact opposite stance that the American government is taking towards uh, private uh, user privacy on the internet, um, in the vast wild of the internet. Uh, as we, I believe they they did pass. Uh, net neutral or they they abolish net neutrality if i'm not mistaken but so they're the, still in discussion about coming bringing it back i don't really know it's sort of like everything uh it's old news now right so no one cares about it anymore so i, I don't even know uh yvonne <laughs> sounds like great heist is about to happen. Sounds like a great heist is about to happen, says Divine Hailstorm. It's possible, um, but you never know. Google has a lot of money. They could pay some really highbrow lawyers to uh, finagle their way out of this uh, lawsuit. Yeah, I'm also pretty sure it's it's uh, this will be the electronic heist of of you know the oceans level of electronic heist to, to heist this 5.1 billion dollars i'm pretty sure that <laughs> google would be very like hawkish and walking it and watching it and you don't have the ability to recreate the uh the uh, vault of the bellagio right. in electronic space <laughs> out of control so it would be amazing but um so what the interesting thing is that net neutrality has been repealed uh officially it's repealed yes in America, but yeah. What the results of that aren't, I think, being fully implemented just yet. Okay. So we have yet to see what the rejection of net neutrality will result in in terms of uh, throttling internet, blocking mm -hmm. some sort of apps or websites, or um, like your internet provider being able to block um, kinda, like news stories that are critical of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, paid prioritization from like Netflix or Hulu or other you know, like uh, media companies that have to rely on internet service providers in order to provide access 
Um, we've talked about this a couple times. I know our second podcast, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that we ever did was uh, about net neutrality. Right, bef- uh, not right before, but before the the vote took place. So I think that what we can see is that in the European Union, they're striking out against Silicon Valley now, mm-hmm. and in America, we're bending to the wishes a lot of the time to high tech and Silicon Valley. And we're pushing other countries to respect copyright laws. Like, the Trump administration is excited about the rejection of net neutrality and deregulating Silicon Valley's Mm -hmm. and internet providers here, while pushing hard to have Chinese uh, tech companies adhere to international copyright standards. Do you think uh, this sort of uh, dichotomy in in the way in which... uh both nation well we'll we'll call the EU a nation for now it's obviously not uh and and the United States government are going about uh regulating the the uh the uh net neutrality type situation going on here do you think that's due to um most of these companies being centered in America and there's a lot of lot maybe perhaps lobbyists uh that are um influencing our congressional leaders and and senate uh people senators i i think for sure that has something to do with it as divine hellstorm is pointing out here he says i think the eu will win i feel like the people of the Mm -hmm. eu will back their government on this and that's part of the the reasoning right so the european union citizenry has been very active in protesting the unlicensed uh or unwarranted search into their data, how their data is being used, especially by companies that are not based in their home territory and Mm -hmm. are simply making money off of their own personal data, right? When you have a free, a free use, um, tool, what, how do they make money if you don't have to pay for it? Well, if you can't see where money is being made, then you yourself are the product, right? You are what's being sold. So in America, Facebook, Google, um, all these high-tech companies are using your personal information to make money. And this is a sound strategy for a lot of companies that make lots and lots and lots and lots of money. If you look at our biggest uh, billionaires, our largest um, companies in the world, a lot of them are coming out to move up in the the stratosphere Mm -hmm internet companies the they didn't Man make Alive, anything physical yeah right didn't make anything physical well amazon just sells things um that are physical i guess but right but they use yeah. the they also use data mining in order to and cookies and things like that to like be like hey you were interested in, in uh you know rubber ducks here right. are three different examples of rubber ducks that we exactly. also think you might be interested in. Meanwhile, you're watching something on YouTube. Right. No, I, I, they, they both buy and sell uh, information. Uh, Amazon does, does both, I'm guessing, um, based off uh, user statistics and things like that. And definitely, they, they, I mean, it's not, you can't just say it, it was because of that uh, that Amazon rose to power. They also did provide a lot of uh, a lot of uh, things that we take for granted now in, in terms of uh, online market spaces um, and, and storefronts. So I, I think that Amazon definitely has some credibility there, but they also obviously are the worst company in the world right now because <laughs> they're taking over the world. They've also been able to uh, <laughs> run at a loss right yeah for a surprising number of years and part of that is you run at a loss for x number of years in order to increase your market share Mm -hmm. and you're able to cover cover your expenses at their minimum rates based on investors uh the appeal that investors have in the growth of your company jeff bezos to to draw back the long to what we were talking about in terms of internet service providers this is exactly what the cable companies did in order to uh consolidate market share and make sure that they shoved out all of these smaller ISPs mm-hmm. is that they were running at a ridiculously low rate in terms of providing cable uh, or faster internet uh, to a, a larger number of people. But they could do that because they, they were a much bigger business to start with. They could run at a loss. 
and then later they could hike up the prices once they had uh, consolidated market share within the three, four, five companies that run all of internet across the United States. And so this is one of those things, right? Um, you want your government to be able to stick up for you, the person who's yes. voting for them. And in America, that is tinged with, like what you were saying, lobbyists or different financial investments. Not to say that probably there aren't mechanisms by which uh, foreign companies can invest in elections in Europe or different places, um, just like the Russians were accused of and talked negatively about in the past election. Let's say that <laughs> Google wanted to influence the election in, I don't know, France or Germany. <laughs> Oh boy! Look, anyway, I wouldn't, um, <laughs> or I would. I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. No, I actually said I would say that. Um, but <laughs> God damn it! Anyways, uh, I really think this is a, a step forward. You know, the governments are are standing up for their people. I think uh, we side with Divine Hailstorm here. Uh, definitely would support it if my country might get five billion more dollars. It's a lot of money. Uh, also, taking a lot of money away from Google. But Avon, don't we all use Google anyways? Isn't it just the best search engine anyways? Or I think there... it's the best search engine. I think so too. Uh, that I've <laughs> used, but it doesn't mean that the practices that they use are fair, right? Right. Just because that we've chosen to use this doesn't mean that we need to be forced into making that choice. And what the companies, um, what internet companies That's do... That's literally what they're suing over, it, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Is there, they have done extensive research into <laughs> how, how much, or how little is necessary to remove the question from the consumer's mind. Mm -hmm. So the consumer is going to search things on the internet. Right. How quickly can you force that user to go to what you want them to do is really an art and a science. So by prioritizing their Google apps or search engine, mm -hmm. it's just that little bit of tick over that secures an almost positive, like, without doubt secures that the users of an android system uh, android like system smartphone will use a google search engine will use right. a google app google uh, chrome which an, comes which pre installed is an unfair, uh and considered i guess by the eu to be an unfair advantage and um was the reason that this font came in now this isn't the only time that the European Union has actually fined Google for this kind of underhanded or um, kind of advantage seeking position. They actually sued them previously uh, last year for a fine of 2.7 billion dollars in a similar antitrust case uh, that they won uh, that favored comp uh, Google, that Google was favoring its own comparison shopping service in search re uh, search results uh, and a lot of people who have been critics of the post ruling have said that basically Google has sidestepped um, the European Commission's uh, ability to enforce anything because the e the European Union failed to give them directives of how to fix it okay. they just said this is a wrong practice you must fix this and never gave them a step-by-step -step detailed or like even bullet points of necessary steps. They said, you have to do these bullet points. The result has to be something that looks more like this, but Google was able to circumvent. I mean, they have the, some of the brightest talent if on the earth. They're paid very well in order to make sure that mm -hmm. Google can adhere to whatever law exists, but do it in a way that still is beneficial to their own company. Right. And uh, Divine Hailstorm says he loves Google. Um, I definitely use Google probably once a day, at least. Actually, I, I use don't, Chrome I don't think consistently. I, yeah, I use Chrome every day. Um, it's pretty much the most solid uh, web browser out there. I mean, look, we're not complaining, and the Uni European Union is not complaining that Google puts out 
bad products. They're putting, they're just trying to make it a fair marketplace, which I believe is probably the best way to go about things um, on the internet. Uh, just give give other companies a fair share um, at at selling their product or at least pushing their product forward, because otherwise there's going to be a monopoly on the market and Google will own everything, which they pretty much already do, at least in America. So yeah. yeah. And this is these like this is kind of similar to the monopoly antitrust lawsuits that were brought against Microsoft way back when, right? Oh right, so exactly. Microsoft was a company that put out the software that most PCs ran on. Mm -hmm. The same way that Google puts out the software by which a lot of mobile phones run on. Now, Microsoft also was able to push Microsoft Word, Internet Explorer, all these Microsoft-based uh, products and edge out kind of other competition because they put them on as, the, as a favorable thing. Uh, and they were also sued for um, Monopoly. And this is a very similar court case. However, this is the European Union going against an American company versus what was then uh, American regulation on an American company. Right. So you're saying that our government, uh, our government's views on regulation has changed, and uh, we once had a, a far more regulations on on the ways companies um, push their products or or um, came into the marketplace. So uh, obviously, Microsoft is still synonymous with word processing. You always think about Microsoft Word. They did a lot of good advertisement, and they tried to get a monopoly on the market, um, but they don't necessarily have them. You can still use the LibreOffice, or uh, I can't think, I guess Apple has Pages, which I think you have to pay for as well. But, um, you know, look. There are a ton of, like, tough. I think, smaller companies that also put out free products or, like, yeah, LibreOffice heavy products. Yeah, is free, um, is open source you don't have a word so, processing suite so there are a lot of things that are going on in these european court cases um so when this happened with microsoft in 1998 and mm -hmm. the ruling came out down in 99 uh the microsoft lost that case too Right, and the judgment was that Microsoft would be forced to split into two parts. Okay. Um, so I didn't this, know that. This was the idea that Microsoft had um, Xbox Microsoft. and Microsoft. That's what well, they split into. <laughs> I'm kidding. Microsoft had been in violation of, of uh, Monopoly and would be forced to. Um, one one part of Microsoft would produce the operating system. The other one would produce uh, so other software components like uh, Internet Explorer mm -hmm. or other other versions oh boy. of that. That that division got fucked. <laughs> they suck. <laughs> <laughs> they should all be so, fired. <laughs> that was the that was the decision that was made, which was immediately appealed. But uh -huh. um, that was the remedy which the U.S. courts had come down to. Now, okay. the European courts aren't able to um, break up Google in the same way. They don't have that same power. It's an American company. But the fines of this magnitude are part of a, or I think, an organized, orchestrated event to check the power of Silicon Valley American tech companies yeah. in other places across the world. And this is a really interesting time to be doing this because... The European Union and the United States have been engaging in these tariff trade wars, right? Yeah. Uh, Trump really has this hard line uh, position. So, I do you see this as a as a kind of either Response. as a reflection or retaliation to Trump's position on tariffs and trade wars? Um, well, it depends how long this this uh, Google's been pushing their. Oh, I, I really think, yeah, it, it depends how long Google has been doing this, really, which I, I'm not sure. I'm guessing they've been doing it since the begin since Android phones really started getting popular. Um, and once Google saw that, they probably saw an opportunity to, um, you know, get 
Google apps into the hands of millions and billions of people. So I, I think they ju Google acted on that just to, you know, they're a company, they want to make money, and this is their product. And it actually happens to be a decent product. Uh, and the European Union probably let that slide because they didn't, maybe they, this is, again, a new um, emerging market too as well. So you have to factor that in. We don't really necessarily have, um, it's not regulated in the same way that that uh, physical goods are, are regulated. So, so we have to lay down the laws in order to regulate it. And this is one step in, towards that. It's just so, I, I'm not sure if it's coincidental or not. Um, I would probably say it's not, <laughs> uh, given that Trump is trying to impose all these tariffs, not only on the EU, but also on China. Uh, so I think that I think this is a pretty decent way to retaliate. Google is one of the largest companies in America. I think it is a fairly strong message to send yeah. that America, uh, some of the strongest American companies aren't without other ways of being touched, even if it's not a physical product. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at the remedies and the decisions that are being made by this EU and the proposed remedies that the European Union is giving to Google, a lot of this is like you don't, you can't force companies to uh, pre-install Google, uh, Google apps and the Google search engine. Right. You have to allow um, the uh, uh, alternative companies to provide the same kinds of services that you do. So services like DuckDuckGo, which is kind of like a privacy-focused... I uh, think I've heard of that one. ...search browser, which is kind of like uh, incognito mode type things. Right. Which is, or like a full VPN type search engine. Uh, so these would be different ways in which the... Even though the phone runs Android, it's not so exclusive to Google products that it, it would be... Um, discouraging for consumers to seek out alternatives to the things that are pre-installed or a Google thing. You know, until um, until Google um, released the Google Pixel, I, I actually thought that Android was a Google company or was owned by Google. I, I, I was not really, I don't really pay attention Android to Android is smartphones. a Google software. It's a software? I, I, yeah, didn't, so I didn't even Android know that. Android is an operating system. Okay. Yeah, yes. I know that. <laughs> I know that much. Uh, yeah. But so Android is the operating system. Yes. Google creates their... I said software, what I meant was operating system. Thank you, Internet, for yelling at me for yeah. the past 20 minutes. <laughs> um, um, I'm sorry. I apologize. I we don't wrong. have that many viewers. <laughs> we just got Divine Hailstorm here. <laughs> uh, well, Internet and Divine Hailstorm, I'm sorry. Um, so the Android is the operating system that a that the like vast majority of non-Apple phones use. Yeah. It's like I think 80% of the world's smartphone market is, is Android. Is Android based? I believe that. Um, so it's a. Tr tremendous amount of uh, opportunity for ad click-throughs for data investigation different things that mm -hmm. you know provide google with the real revenue which isn't the uh, operating system itself okay well that's interesting i didn't know i thought android was a separate company for a while then and now i i was right when i thought before damn it okay well that's that is a interesting thing to know um that's my bad if I confused you. No, no, that I I don't even know what I was trying to say then. I, <laughs> I have no idea what I was trying to say. Anyways, I was just trying to say that and then let you keep going. So uh, <laughs> otherwise, uh, in other news about European yeah. unions dealing with um, uh, with uh, Silicon Valley, the European Union in May passed uh, the General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR. This was a G -G -H -F. <laughs> enormous uh, piece of legislation, okay. uh, which I think that you, Julian, were a bit confused about when I was like, yeah, European citizens can do this. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, totally. So what, what does this uh, in entail? 
if you, I if, don't from what know. I've told you. <laughs> I don't know. I'm okay. not sure. <laughs> so the GDPR will let people reduce the trail of go, information left when browsing social media, Sorry. reading the news, or shopping online. Individuals oh, will be yeah. able to request the data that companies hold on them and demand it to be deleted. So this is a way for cons- like the product, which is people, mm-hmm. to be able to see what data companies are collecting on them and goes a step further beyond that and allows them to demand that that data be deleted. This is a further step that European Union has been going towards in terms of their like right to pri- like right to privacy. internet privacy. Yeah. Um, which has been a kind of social issue that they've been engaging with for a few years now, um, especially with the tremendous push of companies like Google and Facebook into these huge realms of being able to be the targets or themselves manipulators of elections. Right. So, Yvonne, is this... uh is this currently being drafted or or is it is it in place now so the interesting thing is this is in place and this is why in may a bunch of people's um inboxes across the the world uh were saying like our privacy um, policies have been updated exactly because even though the european union is only one part of the world it's the GDPR was so powerful that it it required Everything certain global updates for privacy policy. Cool. Now for the European Union, it is much more robust, I think, than it is for places o- other than the European Union. Uh-huh. My question is like, if you VPN create an account and fa- a, a Facebook account from Europe, do you get the protections of the GDPR? Do you have to be a European Union citizen? Uh, and as such, if sure. you're a non-citizen and live in Europe, do you still have the same protections? I have no idea. I don't understand uh, immigration law too well. <laughs> uh, I think this uh, what we've been doing in America it even complicates it much more for me. So, Yvonne, yo, I was um, my question was uh, I asked you this earlier was uh, let's say you know I want my my data deleted from these databases how long does that actually take and who do i even contact about that so i think that as part of the setup of this policy it would require companies to have a process by which they could uh a cons- uh, a user could both check their data and then request it to be deleted mm-hmm. um you know, most likely this would also mean that they couldn't use that that service in okay. X amount of ways afterwards or something like that. I'm not I'm not a super well versed in what the like nitty gritty of the law is. However, it is clearly a way for people to be able to come as a group and united and work uh, as a class action way of uh, removing data. So probably the best way that this could be handled is that a group of users for Facebook or Google or whatever company that they were trying to um, retaliate against in terms of using their own data for whatever purposes, they get together, form a lawsuit um, as like hundreds or thousands or just, you know, a few uh, whatever of people and then bring that lawsuit against one of these major uh, companies. I think this is the fastest most uh secure way to make sure that this kind of regulation is enforced and also a way to make sure that that like ease of process is set up for future people to be going through so i think even though this law has been passed i think it'll take a little bit of time for it to be fully enacted and in this kind of like what is the turnaround time how do i access Mm -hmm. my data how do i demand that it be deleted like, I think those kinds of issues are only going to be the result of companies being forced to do that. Okay. Uh, do you think that e- with net neutrality gone, that we could enact a similar kind of policy and that would help protect people even if we didn't have net neutrality? Uh, I would think it's probably going to be done by third party companies first. I don't think our government is ready for this type of uh type of law uh, this is a a law right mm-hmm. okay yeah i don't i don't think our our the way 
I see that the FCC is regulating things or lack thereof regulation, um, I don't think that they would even want to think about doing this type of thing. So I, I really think it's it's going to be like a third party type thing um, that that does this first, and then we'll probably get shut down, and then you know there there will be back and forth types of arguments, and then maybe like 10 years down the road, we could get something like this in America. I don't think this is the type of thing that will get passed in America, personally. But if... I want if it to it be passed, was, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. We all want to be able to protect our own data and, and not be the products of some megalomaniacal yeah. corporations. Um, but do you think it could be used... If we had no net neutrality but had data protection or data mining protection are the are those ways to help counteract each other like is if we can increase regulation in certain ways like mm -hmm. data mining and data protection could that counteract no net neutrality uh i feel like it it could partially or are these counteract two separate it separate sure. issues completely i think well okay they're they're not two separate issues i don't think because because uh, the way I foresee, uh, the way I think of net neutrality is, is there's, there's just everything, you know, is, is a neutral plane on the internet. So you can access any website um, and your data, sorry, so your, the, the internet company that you pay, I pay Optimum, for instance, they don't have, if, if, the, if GDPR was in America, right, Optimum would not have, or they still have access to my data and where I'm going on the internet. They obviously know where the hell I've been. They know which porn I'm watching, all right? But if I, uh, according to what you've, how you've described GDPR to me, again, I'm, I'm not as well-versed, um, not saying you're well-versed, I'm not well-versed with this. The way you've described to me is I could contact Optimum or or some third uh, another party above optimum to get uh to cut off the line of their gathering of data for me uh that would n no longer happen so having gdpr definitely counteracts net neutrality is what i'm saying that's all i'm saying i don't know okay <laughs> i think so because if if the the way the biggest issue with having no net net neutrality is that optimum could throttle my internet uh in terms of i can't go to twitch as often let's say they don't like me going to twitch for some reason they mm -hmm. could just decide that twitch is a bad website because twitch doesn't um give money to optimum let's say that was the situation so they could just throttle my ability to stream to twitch this stream wouldn't be happening right now so that's okay. that's like the the right, net worst case scenario in net, with no net, net net with no net neutrality. GDPR, and by the end of this podcast, yeah. the words net neutrality <laughs> won't make sense. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Uh, and so, if GDPR was in place, then Optimum would have no way of seeing that I'm going to Twitch, right? That's an interesting question. That's um, what I'm because I'm not oh, sure that's if that's an true. Interesting question. Do they know I'm going to Twitch? I'm sure I they would could. I assume because they're the internet service provider, they would have that information. Yeah. Uh, and that wouldn't be something that's like, oh, that's an interesting way of of looking at it. I don't think that that would be the exact correlation. Okay. But that that might be that might very well be like if everything is is like. Basically, if you look at a web page, then you your IP goes to a different web page. The history of that previous web page that you saw was completely erased. Mm -hmm. I don't. And so help. The, I don't your know. internet service provider only knows that you're on X web page. Look, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think that the, the more I think about it, <laughs> yeah, the internet is confusing. <laughs> the more I think about it, the more I think that uh, net neutrality and GDPR um, wouldn't be a check and balance against each other. Um, okay. Because I think that the regulation of data wouldn't necessarily be a way to ensure that, you know, access to Twitch is granted. 
the difference that's being the like only twitch... website i care about <laughs> right yeah so the difference being like twitch could see its ad revenue go down because people aren't visiting as much um and then they could try and buy personal data sets to see where people are going because they're mm-hmm. like they're not going to twitch where are they going for their live streaming services and then they don't see where people are going to, then they can understand that they have been throttled and that they can then um, react and do a, an agreement of increased internet speed to their website and paid prioritization right. uh, is another way of putting that. And that would be a way for them to do that. Now, alternatively, with GDPR, people could eliminate their data, and so Twitch wouldn't be able to buy that, and they would just be stuck wondering why people aren't <laughs> able to access Twitch as much. Okay. Um, but I, I don't know if they're necessarily ex- or exactly checks and balances. I think that what, what the greater message would be is that Silicon Valley, or like Silicon Valley and their data mining are checked with GD with a like a reciprocal GDPR in the U.S., but net neutrality is like internet service providers can go free. They're bonkers. They can do whatever they want and demand money from other people. So then it would be kind of like doubling down on uh, media companies or people that provide services mm-hmm. and being like, you don't know what data you have or like you can't you uh, you can't make revenue off of people's data and you have to pay us more for people to use your service. So it could hurt Silicon Valley doubly much, <laughs> actually, if this continues, this kind of process continues to happen where, like, media companies or, uh, like, software providers or, like, uh, like websites like Facebook, they can't generate as much revenue because their data goes down, and they also have to pay more because uh, of net neutrality being broken up. Right. It would be an interesting, like, lobbying group to set out to be, like, we have to reinstate net neutrality <laughs> because GDPR be is screwing funny, their budget actually. so much. Actually, that could be that could be the way that it's a check and balance. <laughs> but maybe I'm completely misunderstanding. <laughs> yeah, again, maybe we're not uh, as well versed as we should be to have a t- podcast on this topic. Please tell us in the comments section below uh, if we were wrong at all in what we said. Check us as. Uh, you know, we like to be as correct as possible when we talk about these things. We're um, both men of science. Yeah. We enjoy we enjoy kind of uh, theoretically walking through this process, highlighting news that we think is important that a lot of people uh, either aren't connecting or aren't mm-hmm. highlighting in the same way. Uh, I think connecting net neutrality and GDPR and the growth of Silicon Valley as a global technological and economic power is something that is super important to us and i think is important to our generation and definitely if people can see how two very very educated people (laughs) are slightly misunderstanding parts of whatever the legal jargon is then a lot of other people are completely missing the boat exactly (laughs) exactly so Um, although this might not be passed in the u.s uh brazil japan and south korea are set to follow european lead exciting stuff that's those, those are, are big th- countries yeah three heavy internet use countries that would be uh significant, especially japan <laughs> yeah f- sig- and south and korea. south korea yeah. uh significant bolsters to um the european union's attempt to create this unified global uh pushback against the um the companies that are stealing people's data for their own gain well hey you know i'm glad that at least in other parts of the world you can access the internet fairly and uh, safely. Um, and I think that's really important. I hope the United States takes, uh, uh, takes up this uh, lead or follows the lead of the Euro- European Union, even though that seems highly unlikely given our current leader um, and the way he wants to just be- go to the beat of his own drum and do whatever the fuck he wants. But he also doesn't understand a lot, so maybe that's... we could try <laughs> Try and get it on Fox him. News. <laughs> yeah, get it on Fox News. Anyways, um, so Julian, what do you think the do you, what do you think the future is? Do you think the E the European Union will be the bastion of free and fair internet, and that America will be struggling to catch up in the near future? I think that uh, I think that uh, America's going towards a change. I think this was 
going to be a four year stint of uh, a regime of ridiculousness to say the least um, and I think that maybe maybe our next leader will uh, try to m amend uh, broken bridges or burn down bridges that it seems Trump is uh, on his way towards um, but I, I think that the EU is definitely trying to make its uh, point and become the, the world leaders in, in net, ne net neutrality type issues. So I, I think that, yeah, the EU is probably going to be the leaders in this type of thing. Cool. It seems that way. <laughs> or not cool, depending on your perspective. Cool. I enjoy the fact that there's some pushback. Yeah. Uh, I'm I, excited I to see where, cool. where it leads. You know what else I'm excited for? What? I'm excited for a segment that we end our podcast with called Hungover Radio. This is a segment uh, in which people who watch, listen, or otherwise are interested in the podcast can submit their own work or their friend's work to get promoted. This is a piece of music or some sort of other music in that genre, <laughs> Hopefully which music. could be a music <laughs> type of genre yeah uh which you have worked on written collaborated composed coordinated etc that you want to get promoted we can promote it right here on our podcast we would love to hear it submissions could be sent to gaming hungover at gmail.com again yeah. that's gaming hungover at gmail.com that's right please submit your material so that we can have something to showcase at the end of our podcast last year or last year, last podcast we had someone who really wanted yes. us to showcase some of their favorite music, yes. and this week we're, we're going to showcase it. Julian's Julian's research into this music. I think yes, uh, Trunks is cool is the username that sent in our uh, our submission for the week. Today we're going to be playing Dwarf Fortress music. He sent us the YouTube link, and I believe this is a video game that I have not played. What a surprise. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I, I've never played this video game, but uh, this is the amazing music that plays while in game in Dwarf Fortress. Bay 12 Games. I believe this game is on Steam, if I'm not mistaken. I can't imagine it really being anywhere else because it seems <laughs> like a very small game. Um, but uh, you never know. Nintendo's trying to get 20 indie games per week on the Nintendo Switch. They just announced that. I don't know why they would want to do that, but hell. Uh, let's they go. They gotta build that library. Yeah, they are. Look, I'm saying there. there's already a million games coming out on Switch, so I don't really know why they would want 20. It's just going to turn into the Steam marketplace, and then there's going to be pure chaos, and nothing's going to sell well. It's going to be crazy. Anyways, uh, that's. I hope you guys enjoy Dwarf Fortress music. Maybe go check out the game. I can't necessarily recommend it, but it seems like Trunks is Cool would recommend it. So go ahead and check that game out. Maybe it's free to play. I don't know. But Yvonne, uh, thanks so much for doing this podcast with me. It was a great topic. Thank you so much for suggesting it. Uh, if you guys would like to hear us talk about a topic that you are interested in, maybe send that in. Tweet it at us uh, at Gaming Hungover on Twitter or get in contact uh, with us in some way. We have a bunch of social media links in the description below. Vaughn? Yo. It's been good. Are you going to be streaming tonight? Uh, I'm a little tired tonight. I might not stream tonight, um, but I might pick it up at some ah, random point okay. this week. All right, I, cool. I'm, I'm honest to God <laughs> super tired from this weekend. All right, well, thanks for coming out, guys. Yvonne usually streams after the podcast, so check that out next week. Maybe not because he's visiting. Uh, we're going to be going to the Overwatch Grand Finals, which sadly New York XL did not make it to. Da -na -na. Da -na. But you know who is going? Philly Fusion. Shadowburn. Shadowburn. Philly Fusion. We might be able to see the Russians take over New York City. Be great. We're going to do it. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> vodka galore. We're going to bring if so Philly, much vodka. If to Philly the... Fusion wins... <laughs> We got to the grand finals. We are going to the Russian Samovar, and we are not <laughs> stopping until we are, are asked puking. to leave. <laughs> oh yeah, I think that'll be fun. 
it'll be a good time. You know what? Let's just go there anyways. How about that? <laughs> I like the me. the flavored <laughs> vodka desserts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, should be good a good time. We'll catch you guys next week. Um, should we go Hunger over and raid Brooke? Uh, yeah. How do we do that? Well, know. anyways, we'll we'll end the podcast the recording here. Thanks for coming out, guys. Peace out. Bye.